Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to people around the world. This is Martin Hubel, as always, your host of the DB2 Night Show, and we are at DB2 LUW, show number 240. Who knew? This is their, our 13th year we've got that many shows out there. And uh, my very special guest today is Jim Bean of Sigma Technology. How are you doing, Jim? I'm doing great. And yourself, Martin? Oh, we're doing hanging in there. We're getting ready for Christmas here, and it's always exciting. Just two more or 14 more sleeps, or and then we'll be at Christmas Day, Christmas Eve or Christmas Day, one of those. And we'll, but we're back to having a, a more regular sized family gathering this year as everybody's double vaxxed up here and we're getting our boosters. So we're we're looking forward to that, that's for sure. And let's carry on and flip some slides and get the housekeeping out of the way. As always, please follow us on Tipper, Twitter. Uh, hashtag db 2 night and our replays on YouTube are picking up. People seem to like that ability to look at the db 2 night show and come back to it without having to put stuff on their machine. Uh, we, all, of course, always have the other uh, downloads available, and uh, Jim has a, a, a Christmas size handout uh, for you this, this time around, and uh, we'll be sharing that with you later on as well. Our, our normal disclaimer here, every uh, Things are copyrighted, we respect those, we are recording, and all of that type of thing. And I remember the days when I used to try to read that. I usually made it through without too many mistakes. As always, our quick announcements are, are the upcoming shows. We've got shows booked all the way th into uh, January and, and uh, February. Uh, we'll be announcing more shows as I, I line up the guests for uh, February through June, and uh, what we're looking forward to the next two LUW shows. Johnny John Hornibrook will be here talking of his troubleshooting handbook on access plans. Uh, John is the man and has been the man for like, well, pretty much forever on the DB2LUW side when it comes to uh, uh, the uh, access paths in, and the optimizer in DB2LUW. And then we've got the big boss, Peter Mirsajewski who is a fantastic presenter and a really nice guy. Uh, we're calling that new stuff because there's a new announcement. I think it's coming out next week, and he'll be talking about that on the February 12th show. Uh, so for now, we're just calling it new stuff. So that's a placeholder that you know you, you don't want to miss that show. Next week, we have Datagate from Sonia uh, uh, in the on the DB2 on Z side, Z side, and also... Next month, we have Patrick Bossman in to talk about uh, tools updates uh, from DB2. Of course, those are the free tools, Data Studio, and they're looking at the DSM strategic replacement, and they'll be talking about that as well. So those are great shows coming up. Um, I can tell you in the latter half, in the spring, we'll be uh, having vendor, uh, consultant, and uh, lab people on both sides. And, and uh, we hope you can join us for those shows. I'll be uh, publishing the dates and getting the speakers lined up shortly. As always, our uh, founding and primary sponsor of the DB Tonight Show is DBI Software, and you can uh, watch their uh, video uh, to how to tune DB2 LUW in minutes. And uh, I have uh, good friends in the IBM or in, in the uh, DBI uh, Software Development Lab, and. We talk quite a bit, and they continue to enhance and improve their, their DBI suite of tools. So there's some good stuff there. Congratulations. I think I've got the name correct this time. Stephen Baker of Aetna is a gift certificate winner. And that was sent out to him already. And our, again, our sponsors are yours truly, Martin Hubel Consulting and DBI. And... I think I had these pictures in the last month. I meant to take them out, but Charlie is still barely with us. I think he's going to be uh, going across the Rainbow Bridge soon, and that's a bit of a shame, but uh, it's the reality when our pets live far shorter lives than we do as uh, humans. It's always, uh, we're getting a little sad about that now. But he's still a loving, cute guy. That's the main thing. He's fun to have around. All right, now we're into our studio audience poll. So let me uh, pull these up. 
and uh, we'll launch our first poll, the standard question here, which version of DB2 are you currently running? And uh, I've gotten rid of the 10.5 stuff. We won't talk about that. When I first came on the show, we used to ask about DB2 8.2.2. And of course, that's about 15 years old. And I'm sorry if you're still running that. But um, so please, uh, oh, I'm looking at it. I haven't launched it yet. Now it's this button do. There we go. And uh, good to see the people are on mostly 11.5. We do have some uh, older stuff out there, and that's uh, part for the course these days. Seems the more serious you are, the slower you are in terms of adopting new releases. And at other times you have a, a burning need for the new features, and you get those in quickly. So. With that in mind, I'll close that poll and uh, share the results. And here we have it. Of course, this allowed people to answer more than once. So that gives you an idea though, that uh, most people are on 11.5 or have, have it somewhere. Percentages, of course, are well above 100% uh, there. Our next question is which, uh, which platforms do you run on? AX, SUSE, and other types of Linux, and Red Hat, and uh, Windows. And uh, this looks quite typical. And uh, I think we've got the votes we're going to get. And so let me share that. And we notice that we've got everybody on everything. Ta -da. We learned a lot there, didn't we? So that's good to know. And uh, next thing we'll do is talk about some uh, presentation specific queries. And uh, this is looking at the various tools that you use for performance. And uh, seeing what people have here, this is always good to see. I, some of the tools that come up with like DB2 top, it was DSM top for a while and something before that. And uh, uh, they keep threatening to remove that until people yell at, uh, yell at development and then they update it and bring it and continue to support it. That's good to see. Uh, and uh, in terms of this, we have about 64% of people voted, but I'll close that off and share that. And what we see is we have most people using Explain, uh, Design Advisor, that's one of my favorites, uh, DBI Tools, and then uh, people do like DB2 Top. That's kind of interesting information to share back with IBM. So with that, we'll move on and do our, our last question here before we do turn things over to Jim is how do you consider your DB2 performance? And uh, I'm only giving you one choice here. And uh, this is not really all that surprising to me, um, but it's a, a good thing to see. Uh, 67% say performance is satisfactory at this uh, time in DB2's life after being out for about 30 years. I, I should hope that people can get to a satisfactory level of, of performance. And of course, performance is you're never really done. Um, people with uh, think it's mostly good, but uh, uh, with a few areas to fix and you know what those are. And then uh, a few people don't know and nobody's saying it's unsatisfactory. If you were at this point, you'd probably be looking to do something else. So with that, I'll hide that, get back to my screen, turn things over to you, Jim. And Jim and I made an executive decision in the last uh, uh, last couple of uh, uh, day or so that uh, Jim has far too much material. And um, Jim, this stuff is great. So we've decided that we'll call this part one, and uh, Jim will go as far as he has a, a good break point in mind. And uh, so we'll go for about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll come back and do it again. So you'll essentially get two presentations for the price of one. 
So, uh, Jim, with that, I will be monitoring the question poll and the questions. Okay, great. And uh, I will mute myself so I don't uh, you don't hear me uh, feeding Charlie cookies or doing other things. Uh, but I'll break in as I see questions come through. And if you have anything for me, I'm on it, and I'll be right here. So take her away. I just have one question. Yep, I, I need to share my screen with you. How can I do that? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> You know, the thing with this is uh, I can make a new, I can make a new mistake every time I do something, you know? And of course, uh, uh, you should have it now. I see your screen. So we're ready to go. Okay, and hopefully um, you're, you're seeing the title page here. Yes, I'm um, also seeing your next slides. You're not in presentation mode, you're in... Uh, Kind of a presentation mode, or you're showing both monitors. Do you have two monitors? Yes, I do. Okay, I'm th I think we're seeing both because on one we're seeing the current slide and we're seeing the next slide. I I'm cool with that, but uh, you, I, I don't know if you want to change how you're showing that. There you are. Beauty. Okay, you're all set. Okay. That's just great. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks. Okay, so uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, various considerations and techniques for optimal database performance. And as Martin said, we're going to split this into two because I ended up with much more material, uh, material than I had thought. I have my own list of, uh, what would you call them, disclaimers. You can read through those when you feel like it. The first topic, though, is about hardware, software, and concurrency. And we're going to discuss a couple items here at the DBMS level, the OS level, and the server level. And of course, you know, once you're talking these various levels at the server, you know, you're looking at the resources, the CPU, the memory, et cetera. Uh, storage is another big area in play here. And and one thing that I did want to get into some details about are the costs from the lack of currency. And, and we know this firsthand from some of the work that we did earlier. Um, at, at one point, some of our um, applications were, let's just say, a little bit behind as far as DB2 versions. and there were a couple of uh, cons to that. Uh, there were definitely some security vulnerabilities that we experienced, uh, some code defects, lack of support because you're running unsupported versions. And of course, you didn't have those new features and new functionality that were available with the new release. Additionally, there were beneficial performance improvements that we couldn't take, take advantage of. And in what we ended up doing in some cases was having to apply more CPUs, which generally leads to more licensing costs. So um, for, for the particular, one of the applications that I'll speak to in some details today, part of making it current brought us all of these benefits. We now had better security, we got rid of some code defects, we had better support, et cetera. But first, one of the databases I want to look at, and this is from the hardware perspective, this is one of our larger data warehouses that we have in DB2LUW, this is for one of the data warehouses uh, out of a group that total about 85 terabytes. And there were reports that throughput wasn't fast enough, but that it wasn't a performance issue. Well, if it's, you're talking throughput, you're also talking performance. They were requesting more and faster CPUs. And of course, that's gonna impact cost, licensing, et cetera. And it would take some conversion and maybe probably even an outage to the business to implement all this, adds a risk, et cetera. All of this basically points at cost, increasing cost. And what we found out was the issue really wasn't with the hardware, it was more a design and, and the implementation of the design. And because of the way it was implemented, it was resulting in underutilization of the hardware that was out there. There was plenty of hardware available, it just wasn't being used. And we'll, we'll take a look at a couple charts to, to support that. The configuration for this is that there's a catalog node or coordinator node uh, all by itself on one logical server. And then there were eight partitioning nodes that were spread across four servers, two each as you can imagine. And each of these five logical servers has four CPUs and 64 gig of memory. So in total, there is 20 logical CPUs amongst those five servers. And here's a chart. Uh, this is from an older product called TeamQuest, but we still use it uh, quite often in Cigna. And you can see the upper left corner there is the coordinator node. And you can see that's running significantly hotter than the four um, servers that are supporting the eight partitioned nodes, nodes. And in fact, if you look back there in mid-February, we were actually hitting 
and these are one hour averages, so the spikes in the valleys, they kind of get mushed a little bit, but there were definitely periods where we were hitting 100% for some pretty decent times, not just minutes, but hours. And uh, with that, of course, there's all sorts of alerting, the workload slows down, et cetera. But if you look at the partitioned uh, node servers, there's plenty of horsepower available. In fact, looking around here, keeping in mind again that there's four CPUs per server, let's say we're using 100% up there on that first one, so we're using all four, but on each of the others, we're only using one. So basically, we're using eight CPUs out of our allocated 20. And again, you see that up at the top there. It's very inefficient to process this way. You don't get the parallelism you're looking for. And as you see there too, the uh, partitioning node servers generally under 25%. They spike up during backups, of course. And then that catalog node server was very busy pushing 100%. And we had alerts at that node. And, and that kind of violates the whole idea that you're, you're trying to do here. The catalog node, you don't want that to do any of the heavy lifting. True, it's gonna do some work, no, no doubt about it. However, it should not be doing the heavy lifting. It's only supposed to be the coordinator. So as I mentioned earlier, it's not that there was a shortage of CPU, but rather it was the way the CPU was being used. And um, you know, a lot of this has to do with proper partitioning of the larger objects and the placement of those objects. And you, know, you wanna spread that workload. You wanna spread the underlying files so that you get the maximum parallelism possible. Now this example, same database, uh, this is in the March timeframe. We haven't done too much at this point, but I did wanna point out that at least during this, oh, I guess it's about a 20 minute period or so, there's definitely some processing that's doing much better parallel processing. And you can see it right there where the partition node servers are actually being driven to about 60%. That's nice. And the coordinator node server, well, it's running around 50% but a much better usage of CPU, at least for that particular period of time. And in total, we're, we're using about 13, maybe it's 12 or 13 CPUs across the five servers. You're getting much more throughput out of that. You're essentially doubling the CPU. It was driving a lot more IO. And again, it just increases the throughput because you're getting the parallelism you're looking for. And again, you did that, to sl uh, slide back here, you did that without driving the coordinator node to 100%. Because again, as we saw in February, that coordinator node was hitting 100% and that was definitely slowing down the workload. So it's all about proper partitioning and placement because you wanna spread that workload amongst the eight nodes that we have on our four partitioning servers, the logical servers. And obviously it puts more of the hardware to use versus having it just sit there. And that's just one example. Um, there, there's much more that we have to do with this application still because they still have far too much processing on the catalog node. So our DBAs and application folks have been working on that. But uh, unfortunately, these are some very large tables and it's not just a simple snap your fingers and, and move stuff around. And unfortunately, these types of activities always have to compete with business activities. And it seems the business activities, you know, the business deliverables get the priority, but we'll get there. And a lot of this has direct ties to configuration parameters. We'll look at a few of those shortly. You know, parallelism, whether you're employing that or not, and how many cores, what's the speed of the cores, whether or not you're deploying compression, what impact that has. And also, you know, offload accelerators, you know, things like the IDAA on the mainframe side that, uh, you know, DB2 up on ZOS uses. Reporting databases, we, we do some of that here. We used to do a lot more where we had more on reporting databases to separate that from the OLTP workload. But whenever you do any of this kind of offloading, you can always look at minimizing the data that you're moving around and putting on your, let's call it alternate copy. That could be logical or physical, but uh, you wanna minimize that data horizontally. Maybe you don't need every single column. Uh, you also wanna limit that data vertically. Maybe you don't need every single row. For example, we have applications that may need to retain appeals data for years and years, but non-appeals data, well, we can get rid of you know, far quicker. And of course, a lot of tables may not be necessary either. So you can do some other minimization there. And of course, if, if you are having alternate uh, reporting databases or alternate uh, schemas where you have this information, you definitely wanna look at optimizing that for that specific processing. So for example, you may have different configurations, 
You may be using different storage because maybe it's not so important. So maybe you put it on optical or something, you know, far less expensive. And of course the indexing requirements can change from a reporting environment versus an OLTP environment. And speaking of storage, there's generally three levels, the solid state divide, uh, drives or SSD. Uh, we oftentimes call it flash DASD at Cigna. Uh, spindle, that's our traditional platters rotating. And of course, optical that I mentioned, which is far slower, but also far cheaper. Now, database configuration, there are lots of things to look at. And I'm not gonna you know, read through every item on these slides. It's just to give you an idea of some of the things, and I will take a, take you through one or two examples, uh, maybe it's a little more than that, to, to look at some of the impacts that can happen with proper sizing and proper usage of some of these things. So for example, here on this first slide about configuration are parameters that control certain features, whether or not you're gonna use compression, external tables, uh, parallelism, query optimization levels, HADR, which I know we use at Cigna and hopefully a lot of other folks are as well. Monitor, tracing, even the self-tuning options. There's a lot to consider here. And, and obviously we can't dig into all of these here because the presentation wouldn't be two parts, it'd be 20 parts. There's so much here that you can do. And then some additional ones on uh, configuration parameters that control and allocate hardware resources like caches. That's an important one. And, and there's an example coming up on that one. Automatic memory management, we've been doing that for several years and had some very good work uh, and good success there. Um, page cleaners, CPUs and speed. And, and one thing to kind of mention there, um, I forget if I get into it in here. I know I had wanted to add it. I may not have added it though. Every now and then, especially these days with servers being logical and being pushed all over the place, just keep in mind your CPU speeds could be changing without you knowing it because you are server, in quotes, your logical server, is being moved to a different physical server. And when that happens, you could be on different uh, speed cores or CPUs. So what we try to do at Cigna is whenever we are recycling a database, we set the CPU speed, one of those um, configuration parms, to negative one. And what that basically tells DB2 is, hey, when you come back up, go through your timing algorithms, your calculations, and come up and get the actual CPU speed, just in case you moved. And it's amazing how often that does happen. And then there are other configuration problems on logging and recovering, utility processing, et cetera. But the first one that I wanna get into some detail is the proper use of the DP2 LUW package cache. Believe it or not, no surprise, we see a lot of products, including IBM products, <coughs> excuse me, that come in and they are not using parameter markers properly or correctly. And what that means is they're not taking advantage of the DB2LUW package cache on the mainframe. It's, you know, your dynamic statement cache. But what ends up happening is we spend much more time compiling SQL statements than we do executing them. So with the proper use of parameter markers, you'll see a, a big improvement as far as using the space in the package cache. And more importantly, it's gonna reduce your, or can reduce your CPU significantly, especially again, if you're spending more time compiling SQL than you are actually executing them. Now, this particularly applies to repeatedly executed statements that have uh, varying wear criteria, <clears throat> excuse me, especially in like a, a highly active OLTP environment where you've got these calls that are running, you know, a millisecond or two or even sub millisecond, but you might find out they take a millisecond just to compile. And that's because it's doing far more work when it is figuring out access paths versus when it's actually executing those access paths. So the repeated compilations can really add a, a tax or a penalty on CPU. And by the way, most of that CPU, I'm sorry, most of that time for compiles is CPU because almost always your compiles are CPU bound. Because in theory, all of the information that the compiler needs is in the DB2 catalog cache, pretty close to it. That's another item you should uh, monitor if you are doing a lot of compiling. You wanna try to make sure it's large enough so that everything is in there that the compiler needs. And if so, your compiles run much faster because it's not going out to disk to grab any kind of uh, security, auth ID information, information about tables or indexes, you know, metadata types of things. Hopefully that's all in the DB2 catalog cache. So any compiling you do have to execute runs quickly. And um, I'm gonna use an example here for a, a CRM app here at Cigna. 
where uh, I forget exactly when it was, maybe it was uh, earlier this year where we implemented changes to reduce, and there were application changes to cut down on the SQL compilation in prepare time. And we saw that these were only taking a millisecond or two, but some can take as much as 500 milliseconds, even more. I've seen some that take multiple seconds because it was so complicated, the number of tables access, joins, unions, and the number of indexes on the tables, et cetera. The more complicated the SQL, the larger the tables, the more indexes, et cetera, the more work it takes for the optimizer to come up with the proper access path. But generally, they're small. But in these very high quantities in a very active OLTP system, it still can lead to significant time. And here I mentioned, yeah, it's almost always CPU time. So this following slide, um, in preparation for this, what had happened was we, we, we have a one one freeze as most companies do. And during that freeze, we noticed that, wow, we had some things going on with some new SQL calls that uh, were in the environment, six sets um, of SQL calls, all dynamic. And we noticed that our comp and prepare times uh, increased show you that chart real quick and you can see that that actually happened toward the end of January and it, I'm sorry it happened earlier the end of January is when we fixed it so what we did do was again we instructed the application on proper usage and how to uh, you know use the parameter markers within their SQL statements for these six sets now why these six sets well we did some analysis of the package cache and we did find the ones that were you know doing the heavy compiles because some of the tooling, it's difficult to find that. Compiles are very fast. But if you look in the DB2 package cache, and you can actually do a snapshot of it, and you can pull it off with select statements, I mean, you can pull off, and you can see exactly who's doing it. And I'll show you some examples shortly. And what we did for this application was we identified the top six uh, that were by far making up 80 90% of it. And so we went after those. And uh, some of the other ones were batch, and some of the other ones less important. You're always going to have some compiles, but you, you just don't want to have some of what I'll show you momentarily. And what we saw that it reduced the comp and prepare times about an hour or 85%. And it was, again, pretty much all CPU time, so about an hour a day. And it also reduced the overall database processing time by 12% because there were so many of these compilations each day. And again, we picked those top six because it gave us the biggest bang for the buck. Why did I pick six? Probably because number seven really didn't have that big of an impact and same with number eight. And again, here's that chart where we saw the improvement implemented at the end of January. Now, the same thing can happen with batch. So for another application, and this is this application at Cigna is well known for not using parameter markers throughout their whole application, both OLTP and batch. And the, um, well, let's just take a quick look at the next slide. The, the compile times are in the blue and this light turquoise. And you can see, especially the overnight hours, 8, 9 p.m., midnight, 1 a.m., et cetera, there are, um, there's a lot of uh, comp time. In fact, it's almost all comp time. Over the course of a whole day, it's about 43%. And if you look at certain hours, like we were just looking at in that chart, it's pushing 80, 90, even 100% of the time being monitored by our tooling. And significant improvements can be made to batch processing, obviously, by using parameter markers correctly, because you're going to save lots and lots of time, especially when you're talking 50 plus percent. And that's all just by eliminating redundant compiling, saving CPU time, etc. Some more information about parameter markers or host variables, as they're called on the mainframe. Um, use them uh, appropriately for frequently executed dynamic SQL uh, calls with varying where criteria and the time it saves, et cetera. Um, and, and I mentioned this earlier about compile time can actually exceed the SQL call execution time. That happens very, very often. On a well-tuned application, your compile times can be worse and usually are worse than uh, compiling the SQL. So, I'm, I'm sorry, then executing the SQL. So you want to compile as rarely as possible. As mentioned, it can have a drastic impact on CPU. And you can actually find some of these savings. And then that's one of the uh, examples that we're going to look at next year. Um, and likewise, you can also use that packet cache, as I mentioned earlier, uh, just by looking at it. And you can come up with those SQL call candidates that aren't using parameter markers. And you can kind of weigh them by how bad they are versus others. 
And that's what we're going to do now. I'm going to flip to the next screen. And you can see now this, this is information coming directly from the DB2 LUW package cache. The number of executions is one for all of these. That's a dead giveaway. Compiles, one for all of these. Again, a dead giveaway. Compile milliseconds, pretty darn quick, because compiles are still pretty darn quick. And if you look at all these SQL statements, just updates, you can see where they're updating case ID, where common ID in, and usually it's a in list of one, sometimes two or three or more, but they're using a literal for that in clause. So that means DB2 is going to recompile each one because these are unique and distinct SQL statements. What should be done instead is they should be using parameter markers for these instead. Then you would see for all of these SQL statements, there would only be three entries in the package cache, one for an in list of one, one for an in list of two, and one for an in list of three, and you'd get a lot of reuse and you'd save that compile time. And keep in mind, this is just a subset of these. This list, when I generated the report off the package cache, went on for pages and pages and pages, as in dozens, if not hundreds of pages, because this is a very uh, frequently executed SQL call update. And uh, there were just hundreds, if not thousands of these out there. Now going back up uh, later, we're gonna, in a moment, look at another slide that shows using parameter markers appropriately. And uh, we'll look at those and see what they look at, look like. And here's that page. And you look at this one, and it's interesting. I have to look at something. You know, it's been a while since I've seen this. This is a little bit different, but look at the very first SQL statement. That's how you do it. Look at any of these. That's how you do it. You see the multiple executions, sometimes in the millions, even tens of millions of executions. And the compiles, one or two. That's where you're saving the time. So if you take even, for example, We'll, we'll look at the last one there. There are 11 million executions and there are two compiles. Oh, but Jim, the comp time was only one millisecond. Let's go back up here and do some math. So it executed 11 million, 27,200 times, and it was two compiles, but we saved all these other compiles. And that's basically over three hours of CPU time just for that one SQL statement. So again, that was looking at that one on the very bottom where there were 11 million executions. And uh, since, since that statement was pushed into the package cache, huge, huge savings. And one thing I haven't done, I mean, it'd be pretty easy. You just put this into a spreadsheet, do a little bit of math, and you can come up with what the uh, overall uh, CPU time savings are. And I'm assuming that about 95, 99% of the CPU time is due to, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, 95 to 99% of the compile time is all CPU time because again, most of this, if not all of this information is in the DB2 catalog cache. We strive for and pretty much always achieve pretty close to 100%, if not exactly 100% on our catalog cache because any compiles that we do execute, we want them to go fast. The other thing that's interesting on this slide too, if you look at sort of the bottom half, you see a couple of different update calls where case ID in, and you can see a list, okay, sometimes it's one, two, three, four, et cetera. It's real interesting to see the execution counts trail off. You know, as you move up and have more in the in clause, you end up with fewer and fewer executions, which really makes a lot of sense, but it's interesting to see those counts and to realize that, yeah, most people are doing it with maybe four or five case IDs in that in clause, and there are very few that have six or more but it's just interesting to look at this. If you um, pull the information off of your DB2 package cache, sometimes you will be amazed at what you see. You might see stuff like this and you say, wow, this is great, we're using it appropriately. Or you're gonna see stuff like this, many other SQL statements as well. And uh, what you wanna do is sort by the SQL uh, call and you'll be surprised for the ones that aren't using parameter markers. Now parameter markers, again, there are some exceptions because it always depends. And there was a situation recently where using parameter markers was going to degrade performance, so we had to back out a change. This happened where we had some index data on status code, and we all know how status codes work. You know, 90 plus percent of the data is closed, and maybe some is open, some is appealed, some is in process, but in general, most of it is closed, and you really don't care. Definite, uh, the spread is totally non-uniform. Now, when the literals are provided, and of course, with valid run stats, the optimizer knows what to do, which is the best access path to take. And in this case, we we're talking about a batch process and more than 65% of the rows were gonna qualify. And it knew, well, let's use table scan with prefetch, makes perfect sense. There was a 
reason, and I'm not sure why, it came out of an audit, a security audit, that they did not want to see literals in the SQL, and sometimes it makes sense, or sometimes you have to take other paths, but in this case, they decided to use parameter markers because, again, the security audit revealed they did not want to use literals in the SQL. So they just put in parameter markers and started to do some testing. They did some explains, and it looked better because it was using an index. However, this particular access path using a non-clustered index and all the access to the data pages was going to be a huge amount of synchronous I.O., and you've probably heard of it called death by random I.O. They were going to suffer from that. So in reality, the SQL would run significantly longer than a table scan with list prefetch because you know two thirds of the table was going to qualify. So even though Explain showed a lower cost in time runs, we knew it was gonna run a lot longer. So we proposed a couple other things, uh, either going back to the literals or using reopt once because you know there's some options there where it should choose the table scan first. And I'll be honest, they ended up changing something and I'm not sure what they did I think they also made some other changes to the SQL call and they were able to, you know, get out of the jam that they were in, but they definitely did not use parameter markers for this call. Now we're still in the database configuration topics. You know, there are other things too um, that we run into all the time. Things like security, that's a, a big piece of it. And all sorts of different uh, data type defaults and formatting options, especially when it comes to dates. There's diagnostics, there's code page stuff, locking and deadlocking, timeout values, all of this. So, you know, I, I touched on using package cache and some of the impacts, but, you know, there are a whole slew of database configuration items to, to look at here. And there's a lot of self-tuning that can help you with these, but you may find that you can employ those Sometimes you have to look at some of these, but there's great documentation on each and every single parameter out there that can be tuned. And uh, you just have to work through them and the more experience you get, the better. Maintenance, reorgs, run stats, etc. cetera. Um, reorgs and when to reorg and why. First, one topic, one thing that we ran into a real quick point is that online versus offline, at least in the LUW world, we noticed that there were some differences. So for our active tables that we reorg either uh, online reorg either nightly or weekly we found that it made a lot of sense to do an offline reorg quarterly twice a year etc because what we were seeing is that some of the differences between an online and an offline reorg and i forget exactly what they all were but we wanted to make sure that we uh, handled everything that we needed to via reorg the traditional approach you know, for what to reorg and when to reorg. Well, a lot of people look at the logically deleted rows, like if you're purging, you know, and we'll talk about that a little bit too. The other thing that comes up is uh, the location of rows. Oftentimes data can be relocated, let's say to a different page. It's less than optimal. And maybe it's because it didn't fit back on page. So let's say we were updating a row that's on page 8,000 RID 27 and it's got some bar chars out there and all of a sudden they're filled in now. It doesn't fit on page 8,000 anymore. There's not enough free space there to collapse stuff and to uh, put that row back on that page. Maybe it gets put on page 8,050, RID 1. So what does DB2 do with that? Well, back on the original page, page 8,000, it's gonna point, it's gonna add a pointer to the new location. So it's what we call an indirect read or an overflow access. And what it can mean, because now you have to go and get not only that data page, but now it's pointing to another data page, you have to go get that second data page. Maybe it's in the buffer pool, maybe not, maybe there's more physical I.O. And keep in mind, this can happen over and over if a row is updated multiple times over, over the course of time, and it doesn't fit back in the page. You can end up with high amount of overflow access. And this is where a tool is very helpful, or you can start looking through some of the snapshot and monitor elements to, to get this information. But you definitely want to look at the overflow accesses by table. And that's something we do on a regular basis for uh, some of our more critical applications. And that really drives what we're going to reorg because it's an excellent indicator, not only that rows are out of place, but that they're also being read. So in the olden days, we used to talk about, well, near offs and far offs and things like that. And we'd say, oh, we have to you know, reorg this table. What if those are on you know, pages where, you know, or for rows that aren't being accessed? 
don't really care too much. They may not be in optimal placement, but if you're not accessing them, eh, who really cares? But if you are accessing them, these overflow access counters, they are being read, they are being used, you are suffering the performance penalty of having to do additional physical I.O. because the rows are not on the page where they were originally you know, put. Plus it screws up your data clustering sequence. This is all indicative of needing a reorg. So that those we use to kind of priority, uh, prioritize things, not only the fact that we've got rows out of place, but they're actually being read on a regular basis. So getting back to that large data warehouse we started off with, um, there were some maintenance activities that weren't happening regularly and some of the DBAs and myself got involved and there was some reorgs done in March and we'll take a look at those real quick here. Now these SQL calls, even though they're called reorgs, th these aren't reorg jobs, these are SQL calls that were impacted or improved by the reorgs. And you can see, so we, we had some SQL calls, uh, again, there's about six listed here that were taking upwards of two, one and a half to even two and a half hours per day. And you see it drop like a rock down to five minutes a day. Huge improvement because there were tables that really needed to be reorg. I mean, really. Now, again, for this application, this is the one where the partitioning's not quite right. The object placement's not quite right. We're still doing too much up on the catalog or coordinator node. There's still a lot left to do, but we've already done quite a bit including some indexing and some other SQL tuning and, and a lot of purging, but there's still quite a bit more to go. Now run stats, um, they can cause and they can also resolve uh, major performance issues. And we'll talk about two different examples below. Um, just an overview, the first one is from a while back, two, three years ago, but very important to Cigna. Uh, as I was called in to investigate uh, some major CPU and locking issues on a Sunday afternoon. Fortunately, thank God it was a Sunday. Um, there was some maintenance executed early morning on the DB2Z OS side, which required uh, bringing down the apps that we're gonna talk about shortly here. And when they brought them back up, that's when there you know, were quite a few problems. And then the second issue was from this past January, it was a recurrence and that'll be a quickie, but you'll, you'll see there where we're going. The odd thing about that one, the third bullet item there under the second issue is the performance would be fine for weeks. They'd go on for weeks, sometimes months. Then all of a sudden they degrade for a couple of days and then they'd be right back where they were again with fine performance. And we had no explanation at the time, but somebody had a great idea. We'll look at that one too. So this first one, and you'll notice some of these slides come from the 2020 IDUG virtual conference. And this is the old Houston, we have a problem, big problem with CPU, but you know, there's a tendency to focus on CPU, don't always focus on CPU. But in this case, uh, one thing is for certain, um, always know what the problem is before tuning. So that's kind of a, a side or a tangent to this presentation, but it's a very important key point. So we're gonna look at uh, an insert statement running long due to locking. And um, people were focused on that insert, but it wasn't just a problem with that insert and locking. There were some other things going on that people hadn't looked at and considered yet. Uh, in particular, a, a select call, which was a two table join, including the table that was being inserted to. And this all resulted in CPU exhaustion, locking, et cetera. Now, some of these are kind of small. I think I can zoom in. So you'll notice on this particular day, February 24th, all lock wait time, this is the insert, insert to this particular table, med claim detail, all lock wait time, execution times, pretty much normal, sorts nothing, rows written, pretty much normal for a Sunday, uh, rows read nothing, Jim doesn't look bad, except for we're seeing a lot of locking. So a, a crisis call was initiated because of the poor performance and uh, the focus was on locking in these particular inserts, but there wasn't a full understanding. And so the, uh, at, at least one or two uh, recycles were attempted. And, and of course that had, had no impact because they didn't understand the root cause of the problem. So again, getting back to that first bullet, always understand the, what the problem is and impact before tuning or taking any actions. You can recycle this five times, it's not gonna help you. So I was asked to join the crisis call and they were about to recycle again. So we halted that because, you know, at that point I know I didn't understand the problem. I, I knew they, what I was told that they had some inserts that were locking. Okay, fine, but why? Started looking at some other information and we'll see that in the next slide. And the issue shifted to uh, the select that I mentioned earlier, which was uh, locking with the inserts. And the select, although it was normal for a Sunday as far as volumes and things, 
things had really changed. Instead of averaging 70 row reads and 0.2 milliseconds per execution, it was up to 370,000 row reads and 35 seconds per execution. Yeah, big problem there. Again, kind of tough to see, so we're going to zoom in. So here is the, oh, this, this is just overall at the database level. You can see this Sunday is way out of whack compared to any other day, even weekdays in the past. Same with the CPU, same with the reads. The writes actually are a little bit low, well, no, no, a little bit higher, but definitely a lot of locking going on too, as you can see. Now here's the select call. The select call is doing some fetching, but it's also being impacted by lock wait time. You can see that, so he's got some locking. Again, execution counts normal, sorting normal, rows written to temp space normal, but wait a minute, here's our problem. 15 billion row reads were on that day where we usually have nothing or close to nothing and a compilation too. So something changed with this call. So where do we go next? Well, we start to look at the access path and we're gonna look at the before and after and there's a very slight difference there that resulted in a huge difference in performance. And again, this is kind of an eye chart, tough to read. So we'll zoom in. And without getting too detailed, um, the access paths are almost the same. If you look, you'll find out the same indexes are being used, but the costs are different. And then the sorts are kind of misplaced or replaced. They're, they're different, they're in a different location. And the costs, like I said, are way off. Well, let's look up at the before. What stands out, and we saw this as soon as uh, you know I joined the call, is wait a minute, we've got run stats here, executed at 5.30 in the morning, and there's no data on the tables. So what's DB2 gonna do in that case? He's gonna use defaults. He's gonna say, I got no run stats. He would use 10,000 rows as a default, but here it's like, no, I'm not gonna use those defaults. I'm gonna use zero because that's what's on this table according to run stats. It's literally gonna say there are zero rows out there. So it kinda was almost the same access path. The cost is, a, is, a, is less versus what we did afterward, but some sorts are out of place, like I said. So what did we do? We immediately uh, ran stats on those couple of tables that were involved. And I don't even know that these were the actual real stats. In other words, at least at this point in time, that's what we're on these tables. They may not be ideal. They may not be the proper time to run stats. All I do know was zero was definitely not ideal. So we got rid of those. And instead, uh, we ran stats and we pulled off this stuff, re-ran the explain, got a slightly different access path with higher cost, but a sort was moved. Oops. So the access path changed uh, as a result of running stats. Uh, when the two tables were empty, that's what hurt us on that select call. So not the insert, on the select. So we ran run stats again. And again, I, I say with sufficient data in the tables. In other words, it may not be the right or optimal time to run stats, but at least now we had some data in the tables. And the difference was immediate, it was incredible. So instead of the 370,000 row reads in 35 seconds, we were back down to 70 row reads in 0.2 milliseconds, not seconds, 0.2 milliseconds per execution. All of a sudden this select was back to normal, stabilized the CPU, eliminated the locking, and guess what? The insert was back to normal as well. So these are the two calls, the select and the insert. I'm gonna zoom in again. And you can see where they both obviously experienced some major problems and, and the gold color here or orange being locking, major issues. And uh, the one thing I do wanna show you is down here, you notice this is, oh, is it this one here? This is the select. You see the very high row reads in the billions drop like a rock as soon as we fix the access path. Similarly, the insert that was running long, due to all the locking, dropped like a rock. Now there was still some minor locking that occurred throughout the day. Uh, that is pretty normal or typical, but you know, you're talking, you know, two minutes here versus 70 plus minutes in an hour. Now this is the other example of where run stats uh, made a huge difference. And this was interesting because I know I hadn't thought of this. One of our DBAs uh, picked up on this, fortunately. So there's an issue that started on the 28th. This is the one where things would be running fine. Then all of a sudden things would get bad. And then maybe a few days later, things are back to normal uh, without changes being made. So what was going on? And these SQL calls, there were seven table joins and they were union together three times, but they were all relatively small, under 100,000 rows, so not huge. And they had uh, 
let's see. Yeah, I do have a chart. So th this is what I mean. They'd be running fine for days. <laughs> you can barely notice any time for these SQL calls. They're all site admin calls for whatever reason. And then for, day for a couple of days, they were really bad. And why? Well, when they were using full run stats, they got a better access path. What we found out was that the sampled option was being used on run stats for these tables, uh, seven of them, that were under 100,000 rows. So once they removed the sampled option, they've had stability ever since. So sometimes the sampled option really good, especially on your hundreds of millions of rows or billions of rows, but on tables that had less than 100,000, we actually saw an intermittent or sporadic performance penalty of using the sample option. So we removed the sample option, DBA did, had almost no impact to the runtime of the run stats, but obviously it fixed all of the issues. And it's kept it fixed. Um, there are some charts here you can look at, uh, zoom in on your own, and just keep in mind some of these might be in minutes and some others uh, might, might be a little different. Uh, these are a couple of the calls that were really bad and then they improved afterwards. You can see the execution counts. Sometimes they weren't even captured because they run so fast, but they were definitely captured during the period here with the uh, run stats. And, oh, sorry. And you can also see, let me zoom in on a little spot here, where the rows read, that really changed. And also rows written to uh, temp space, not so much, but definitely the row reads changed tremendously with the access path change. Again, resulting from the stats, not using sampled. Some data archiving and purging topics. But Martin, uh, did you want to get in a word or two? Yeah, I think maybe I will. Uh, I've got a, a little thing to show here, and uh, I should probably do that because that's a, that's a good thing to do. Let me. Uh, Very good. Let me see if I can find it here. I think I need to take back control for just give me a minute here. And, uh, Big presenter, there we are. And then I can uh, uh, go in here and I should show this uploaded video. And it's going to show somewhere. I hope. Show video, play. Are we seeing a video? I don't see it. I don't know what I've done wrong. I see the DBI overview screen, but nothing is playing. Okay. I'm wondering where it is. <laughs> oh. So I'm, I'm glad to see the DBI overview screen, but I'm just not sure why that's not playing. Uh, no one can see you. I don't want to be seen. No one can see your screen. People can see your screen. All right. One last try here. There it is.
Okay, I've got that uh, taken care of now. So I will, thanks for watching and uh, I'll get, make you the presenter again, Jim, and we can carry on. Perfect. Okay, uh, we're gonna resume now with data archiving and purging. Now the approach to uh, archive and purge is very dependent on what data you're removing from your tables. It really is dependent on the relative amount. Is it a large portion or a very small portion? And if it is a large portion, I've got a, a list of steps there. You wanna unload, unload any of the data that's gonna be archived, if there is any, maybe it's all just being purged. Um, and then unload the data that is being retained, that is required. Optionally drop some unnecessary indexes. We do that just to speed things up, especially on the load. We always sort the data in data clustering sequence, and the reason for that is because we don't wanna to have to reorg afterwards. Then once that data is loaded, we can optionally recreate any indexes that we dropped and run stat as needed. Uh, this method is uh, very efficient, especially if a large portion of the data is being purged, uh, mainly because there's no reorgs needed afterward. If there were only a small amount of data being purged, th this really wouldn't make sense. And we'll look at that after in, in a moment here. Now, what's interesting about this one too is that there have been some times where we've combined this with hardware updates, uh, re-hosting, et cetera. And uh, using this, it can really minimize your data conversion and transport, especially if you have two sets of hardware as you're going through, like for example, an upgrade process. And this is a, a very useful method if you don't have any automated purge, you don't do it you know, periodically. Um, so instead of maybe a weekly or a monthly purge, maybe you do just an annual purge manually. Now, if a small portion of data is being archived in purge, well, then you would use the traditional method, uh, you know, select statements, pulling off what you uh, need to archive, drop any unnecessary indexes again, uh, delete the data using SQL delete calls. Now, we're not talking about dropping or, you know, eliminating the, all the data, we're just talking about that particular data that's being purged. And then you'd have to consider a reorg. Did you drop so much data that now you wanna reorg the table? Were you in reorg, needed a reorg even before you did the purge? Then of course, if you dropped any indexes, you have to recreate them and, and run stat. This, this method is the preferred method if a small percentage of the data is being purged. And usually that's when you have an automated purge, You know, maybe weekly, um, perhaps monthly, and uh, you could combine that with your periodic reorgs. And then there are a couple other options. I, I won't get into all the details, but in a partition environment, you have other options like using partition rotation. So if you're partitioned by say date, you know, year or month or something, uh, maybe you can just rotate off partitions. That is very efficient. I don't think you can get much better than that unless you're truncating the whole table. Um, and for all of the data archiving and purging methods, no matter what, you gotta be aware of any application or DB2 maintained RI. We can see the DB2 stuff looking at catalogs, but there could be things that are wrapped inside the application code. And of course the RI is gonna drive the sequence of the tables um, as far as uh, archiving and purging. So you, that's why you need to understand the RI. But regardless, you got to have a purge strategy in place to keep the size and the space in check. And it's not so much the size on DASD that matters anymore. It's more the performance. It's more what's happening in memory and the application itself. You know, disk space is pretty cheap these days, but uh, you don't want to waste it, of course. But it has impacts elsewhere that are, you know, pretty big. Some of the things that I'm talking about is like, for example, if you let a database grow and grow your backups, your reorgs, your stats, all the utilities, as well as some batch that scan entire tables are gonna run a lot longer. In theory, it should have minimal impact on your OLTP because in theory, OLTP is pretty fast. It's using appropriate indexing and you're not scanning large amounts of data. You're kind of going in there synchronously and pulling off what you need to satisfy the request, but you're not you know, scanning entire objects. The other thing that's kind of interesting is uh, keep an eye on the levels of your indexes because as data grows, if you're not purging, you could uh, see an increase in the number of levels in your B tree structures within your index, and that can indicate an extra physical read, usually does. After you do major large purges and then a reorg, you could see that drop pretty incredibly. And then of course, keeping the objects purged will help keep uh, 
performance in check, especially for OLTP. You may not see any real huge improvements, but it'll just keep things in check. But it can uh, give you some pretty big uh, improvements as far as batch, that is scanning, and utilities, and will keep the run times consistent so they don't continue to increase over time. There are tools out there uh, that help you to facilitate the archive and purge. At Cigna, we're uh, currently using the IBM InfoSphere Optum Archive tool. Uh, there, and there are others out there. They take into consideration the RI that I spoke about from the DB2 perspective, because they're looking at the catalog. And if you haven't purged, I mentioned this earlier, if you haven't purged in a long time, you can see some pretty huge improvements. But remember, uh, if you're purging large amounts of data, you, you need to either use that first method, or if you're using any other method, you gotta make sure that you reorg to reclaim all that free space if you're doing deletes. Because remember, deletes only do a logical marking of the row. It doesn't physically delete anything. Uh, every application, every database must have, should have, all uh, should have documented their data retention requirements. That comes from the business. And from that, the purge rules can be defined. How long do you have to keep the data? Maybe it's not all data because, you know, only some data is needed for a, a longer duration. Some data you can delete after a year or two, but other data has to be retained for legal purposes, maybe five, 10 years or longer. And I, I think we had mentioned this earlier too about only archiving the data necessary. Maybe you only need a subset of tables, some of the rows like appeals data, some of the columns, you probably don't need them all because the smaller the data you have for re, uh, retention, the smaller your archive table, tables or files will be. And you wanna you know, execute this on some regular basis versus leaving it for the one and done, you know, maybe a once a year manual thing. It, it would be better to automate that and to do it during a, a quiet time, you know, nightly, weekly basis. We've even had some applications that were purging on a regular basis throughout the day um, because they had so much data to purge. Just watch out for locking in your commit frequency. You can use a, a product, as I mentioned earlier, or you can code it yourself. Um, just purge that unnecessary data, and then be sure to reorg and run stat as required afterwards. We already talked about some of the impact on sequential batch processing and maintenance. So here's an example where the uh, performance improved pretty greatly after some major purging that was done in September. And this was in preparation for some other activities and it just had a huge improvement. Um, you can just see overall things improve, but what's more important is you look at this slide here and you see the true physical read rates and this is on a per day basis. So the numbers are, um, and these are in reads per second, but if you calculate out the numbers, we're doing over 8 billion physical reads per day before the purge just after that purge, that weekend of September 11th and 12th, just after that purge, it was 6.7 billion physical reads per day. But the reason for that is because the data that was being purged were put in kind of like a, a second set of tables temporarily, just in case there was any problem, just so people could look back at that data to ensure everything was okay before we outright purged it. So there was like a second copy, second set set up. Then towards the end of September, I guess that's around the 27th or 28th, those tables were dropped. And you see, so now the true after purge physical read rate is down to 2.8 billion rows. I'm sorry, 2.8 billion physical reads per day. That's about a 65% reduction. So it was huge once we got rid of those second copy tables that were being retained. Um, SQL, I, I think what we'll do is we'll start part two with this the next time we get together. Uh, I'll just give you a, a quick overview of what we're going to do here. Um, some of this information too is going to come from presentations at the Central Canada DB2 user group as well as IDUG. And in those presentations, you'll, you'll find much, much more on SQL tuning. But there are a couple things, including a couple of new things that I've put in here um, that I want to go over. And, and we'll just review those real quickly on this slide. Um, because, and the reason is because this we come across this often. Uh, I know everyone has heard, don't use select asterisk, okay? I wanna tell you why. You hear it over and over, sure, but it can make a huge difference because if you're doing physical sorting, now you've got more data to sort. So your rows are longer, what you're submitting to the sort and what you're getting back. So the less data, the less rows, the less bytes that you're sorting, the better. And probably more importantly, is it makes a huge difference when the DB2 optimizer is looking at indexes and considering whether or not it can use index only access. If you're selecting everything, that almost rules out index only access unless you've got an index with every single column. 
So don't use select asterisk unless you absolutely positively need every single column. It's a simple rule and that's the way it should be because especially that third check mark there, index only access, you could be killing yourself and not even realize it. Proper placement of parentheses, another pretty simple kind of thing. You'd say, hey Jim, this is pretty simple, right? But we see a lot of abuse or a lot of mistakes made with this. And so we'll look at an example um, next time. And I, you know, just at a summary level, just avoid them when you don't need them and be very careful and be very specific about where you do place them because incorrect placement, not only does it invalidate uh, proper index usage and that gives you performance issues, but more importantly, it can invalidate your results. In other words, you're getting back data you shouldn't be, or maybe you're missing data that you should be getting back because the parentheses are, you know, incorrect, very important. Unnecessary sorting, that's another one. You know, don't do order buys, group buys, and distincts if you don't need to. Don't add them in just because you need, think you need to. You need to look at your SQL and figure out, and your data and figure out if you actually need them. And then SQL simplification and function removal, um, that can definitely impact not only the SQL itself and simplify things, but it can really impact your performance and what indexes are being used, but you have to know your data. You have to understand the data itself, have access to your production data and see what people are entering, what people are doing, what's stored on your tables. And then, you know, you wouldn't, you may possibly be able to remove some functions because you don't want to use any functions unnecessarily. And we'll see an example of that next time. So Martin, turn it back over to you. Okay. So we're at the end of part one, are we? Yes. Great. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry, just clicking buttons here. I've got to find a, a right button. I can always find the wrong one. I'm really good at that. Okay, that's, uh, that's a, I was really uh, surprised at how well you presented all a whole bunch of things, and it was really nice seeing the, the compile times and the way parameter markers really help you folks. I found that, that one in particular really quite interesting. We didn't get any questions Thank today, you. but that's okay because you did a really good job of explaining things. But with that, well, thanks a lot. I also have to ask the final question here, which is, uh, did people, folks learn anything today? And uh, that poll's open now, and uh, I've got the answer. We've got the answer we expected there, which is that. Uh, 100% of our audience learned something. We love that. Glad to see that. And it also is an indication of just what a great job you did. So with that. Thank you again. And thank you to everybody in our fine looking studio audience. And let me just uh, uh, remind people that yes, we will uh, have a part two with Jim. We'll arrange that probably in the March, April timeframe, depending on how things are going. And uh, with that, let me put up our final uh, thank you, screen. Cue the music. Get that going again. And wish everybody uh, a great weekend. Getting ready for the holiday season. We'll see you next week for our final show of 2021 on the DB2Z side. And uh, again, Jim, thanks so much. We look forward to seeing you again real soon. And everybody you, have Martin. a great, great rest of the day and a great weekend. Bye-bye, all. Thanks.